Hello there, and welcome everyone to our MacroHive webinar on the US presidential election. For those of you who don't know me, my name's uh, Bilal Hafiz, and I'm the founder CEO of MacroHive. And my background, uh, again, for those who don't know me, is I've spent uh, over 20 years in research um, at various investment banks from JP Morgan to Deutsche to, uh, to Nomura. And we set up MacroHive about uh, a year ago, a year and a half ago, and we, we've been going strong ever since. Now, in terms of the structure of this, uh, of this webinar, I, I'm joined by my fellow panelists. I have uh, Dominique Dorfreco, who you should be able to see on, on the screen, and I have George Gongalvis. In terms of their background, uh, Dominique has uh, a very extensive background. I won't give a full justice if I went through everything. Needless to say that she's got public sector background. She worked as a senior economist at both the Fed and the IMF. She's got private sector experience, having formerly worked at Bridgewater, Associates, and a few other hedge funds as well. She's also worked on the sell side uh, as well. So she's very experienced. And she's a regular contributor to MacroHive and uh, a real partner to everything that we do. Uh, another partner, regular contributor is George Gengalvis, uh, who is, uh, I like to sort of call him our US rates uh, guru. He knows uh, all things uh, US rates, the microstructure to the macro. In terms of his background, he's uh, run various rates research teams on the sales side, most recently at uh, Nomura. And uh, uh, before that, he was at various other investment banks uh, too. And he has also quite a wide Twitter following as well. So many of you have probably seen him there as well. So those are the panelists. In terms of the topics, uh, I'll provide initially some context around this election in terms of uh, where we are in terms of uh, forecast and polling and so on. Then I'll hand it off to Dominique, who will discuss the economics and the macro implications of various election outcome scenarios. Then we'll go to George and Galvis, who will talk about the market implications. Then we'll move on to the Q&A. And if you look on the, on the Zoom uh, interface, there's a Q&A button near the bottom uh, along the line of buttons that you have there. And uh, feel free to post any questions you have for any one of us on that Q&A section, and I'll be able to uh, see them. And then hopefully I'll ask uh, my fellow panelists, or, or if it's directed to me, I'll try to answer them as well. Uh, we'll try to keep this uh, to under an hour just for the sake of, of brevity. Um, so let me kick off first, just in terms of uh, some of the context for the election. The first thing to, to note is that if you crunch the numbers on previous US elections, and we've done a lot of work on this, and you can see an article written by us on, on the macrohive.com website, uh, we've crunched the numbers around all the different permutations of US elections. And in general, it is true that Republican uh, presidencies do tend to see uh, US equities perform better after the election, at least initially after the first few months. Although interestingly, when you look at the numbers later on, you tend to find that Democrat administrations tend to see uh, stronger equity outperformance further down, uh, the, further down the line. So six to 12 months after a Democrat win, you tend to find that uh, US equities are performing better than had uh, they uh, been under a Republican administration. But in general, the earlier reaction tends to be equity outperformance. Perhaps the most interesting thing in our analysis when we looked at past elections is the US bond performance, where we've actually found that uh, Republican wins tend to see US bond yields go up, whereas Democrat wins tend to see US yields go down, which is in contrast to the way we've often looked at um, uh, where we've often looked at uh, this election, where Democrats are viewed as being the fiscally reckless party where you see higher bond yields. But history at least suggests that bond yields tend to go down as investors tend to view uh, Democrat win as being more deflationary to, to the economy. The dollar part is more mixed, it's less clear cut. Um, the other point to note is that in terms of clean sweeps, uh, when you have a Democrat clean sweeps, that tends to see the worst equity performance. Equity still go up, but they go up less than they otherwise would uh, with a, uh, a mixed Congress presidential outcome under a Democrat presidency, whereas Republican clean sweeps tend to do very well for, for equities. So, so at least on the equity side, historical analysis goes with our intuition or most people's intuition. 
the bond performance tends to go against our sort of intuition. And of course, historical analysis is just that, it's just historical analysis. It doesn't necessarily mean it means much going forward. Now, as for the election tomorrow, um, obviously there's been a huge focus on polling and the errors that were made in the 2016 election. So, you know, back then, of course, polls and most forecasters were expecting a Hillary Clinton win. She didn't win, although she did win the popular vote, she didn't win the electoral college outcome. And so there's been a much bigger focus on correcting polls. And I, my sense is at least that uh, polling companies have made big adjustments to how they weight education at the very least. And there's been more polls at uh, individual state level than there have been in the past. So some of the biases should have been corrected for. But in terms of where forecasts and models are, let me share my screen and show you a spreadsheet where I keep track of the, um, of the various forecast models and so on. So hopefully you can see, I've just pulled up my, my spreadsheet here. Uh, this spreadsheet shows you a bunch of charts which will actually be going into, um, into uh, a research notes later, later today. But essentially the first chart here shows you what various models are predicting for a Biden presidency. So the 538, model, the forecasting model that, that they have is pricing a 90% chance that Biden wins tomorrow. The economist model has a 95% chance that Biden wins tomorrow, whereas prediction markets, and this is based on PredictIt, which is the widely followed prediction market, has a 63% chance of Biden winning. So what's interesting here is that the models have a much higher probability than the so-called market. So people where they're putting money on this are assigning a lower probability of a Biden win, although it's still above 50%. So going into the election tomorrow, consensus is Biden wins, prediction markets have a lower probability though than the models. Now, as for the Democrats winning the Senate, which of course is the other important variable in all of this, both 538 and The Economist have a roughly 80% probability that Biden, that the, the, that the Democrats will win the Senate, and prediction markets have around a 60% chance that the Democrats will win uh, the Senate. So again, we have this dichotomy where the models and analysts have a higher probability of this uh, clean sweep, whereas prediction markets have a lower probability. Now, of course, what really matters are the individual states. And what I show here on the next chart, uh, you know, I, I guess I'm not really, I shouldn't really be showing all my spreadsheets, but here you are, you see how messy my spreadsheets are. But what I've done here in this bar chart is shown you the, the various models and prediction markets for each individual battleground state. So Pennsylvania obviously is the big one where um, last time Trump won this with a very small margin uh, beating Hillary. And this was one of the key states that swung in favor of the Republicans. Today, both The Economist and 538 have Pennsylvania with a 85 to 90% probability that Biden will win that. Prediction markets are lower, around a 60% chance. The other one is, uh, the other couple that are worth looking at are Wisconsin, uh, very high probabilities of the models, uh, 90 to 100% chance that Biden will win. Prediction markets have around a 70% chance that Biden will win Wisconsin. Michigan is one of the other Midwest states that were the big focal point in the 2016 election. Both the Economist model and the 538 model have almost a 90, 95% chance that Biden will win, whereas uh, prediction markets have around a 60, 70% chance. And if I just show you the polling on these three states, um, you might need to squint a bit to be able to see this. Let me see if I can uh, zoom in a bit more. Um, so hopefully you guys are not getting dizzy when I do all of this, but Pennsylvania, this is the real clear politics average of Biden's lead in Pennsylvania. So currently Biden has a four point lead in Pennsylvania. The level of undecideds is around four, four and a half. So my general rule of thumb is if the lead is similar to the undecideds, that's a good outcome for Biden. Um, so generally uh, Biden's doing well polling wise, it's fallen a bit in recent weeks. So that's perhaps something to worry about. Wisconsin has been much more stable. So Biden has a 6% 6 lead, more than the undecideds. So that's a good result uh, so far. So stable, solid. Michigan, again, Biden's been gaining in Michigan, 
So it's almost a 7% lead in, in polls in, in Michigan. So you can see why all the models have very high forecasts for these three states, because all the polling is very solid. It's a fairly solid gain. Uh, where it gets more interesting is the Sun Belt states. Um, if I just go back to this chart here, Florida, of course, is one of the big key states that everybody looks at. The models, uh, both the Economist and 538, have around a 70% chance that Biden will win Florida. Lower than the other Midwest, Rust Belt states, but still um, you know, above 50%. Interestingly, prediction markets have a 40% chance for Biden win. So prediction markets actually think Trump will win Florida. And you can see that with some of the other Sun Belt states, Arizona, its prediction markets are almost at 50%. North Carolina, Biden is less than 50% in prediction markets. And Georgia, uh, uh, Biden is less than 50% as well. So prediction markets are less confident than the models are for those, for those Sun Belt states. And if I show you the polling, you can see why. So Florida, the blue line here, you can see Biden's been losing his lead in uh, Florida in the polling, and it's close to zero now, and the undecided is much higher. So that's one reason why I imagine prediction markets are less confident than models are on, on this. The poll trend is, is not great. If you look at Arizona, here's another one. Um, you know, Biden had a sort of stable lead of around three, four percent. It's been falling since then. So the Sun Belt state, it's not clear at least from the polling side, that it's a slam dunk for Biden, even though some of the models are forecasting them to be such. Um, and the final point I just wanted to mention before you know, I, I kind of hand this off to, to Dominique is that there's a number of states which will take time to process their mail-in or absentee val ballots. Um, what I've done with the background states is I've, I put an asterisk next to the state that could possibly report a quick result, i.e. on Tuesday night, on election night, or Wednesday morning. So uh, Florida, um, for whatever reason, despite their history of um, strange results in Florida, they actually process uh, mail-in absentee ba ballots very, very quickly. So we are expecting to see a Florida result on election night. Um, and so that will be a very important result to get. If Biden wins that, uh, then that's probably the fastest way that Biden could uh, win the Electoral College if he wins Florida, uh, then North Carolina and Georgia, which are all, uh, they all report relatively early on. So they will report the results either Tuesday night or Wednesday morning. The problem though is Pennsylvania, Michigan are possibly going to have a late reporting because they only start processing the mail-in ballots on the election day itself with many of these other States have actually started to process them, process them already. So there is a risk that Pennsylvania, Michigan, two key battleground states, could end up reporting their results on Thursday or Friday. So we have this delay. The other issue is what's called the blue shift, red shift issue, which is that um, on the day for most states, we will get the people who are voting tomorrow, get their results first, which will likely be to more lean towards Republicans. So on the day, it will look like the Republicans are winning, but when the mail-in votes are counted in later on in the day or later in the week, that will then push the vote back towards the Democrat, so-called blue shift. So that from a timing perspective, this could be a tricky thing from a, um, trying to trade the news that's coming out. Uh, so that will be one of the, the challenges. Um, and then the final point to make is that, uh, um, whatever Trump says or Biden says, it doesn't matter about who wins the election. If, if, Trump, if Trump says, I've won the election, that doesn't change the process. The process is at the state level where each individual state process the results and then they report the results, which often can be weeks later, the formal results. What matters is what the state uh, are doing and how the state um, uh, process is, is unfolding. Where it gets tricky is if you have wafer thin margins in key states, which can then trigger recounts or disputes over mail-in ballots. And that all occurs at the state level. Um, so although there's much fears around Trump announcing that he's won the election, um, in practice, that doesn't mean anything. What matters is what each individual state is doing and how they're doing their process. So with that, I think I'll 
kind of uh, wrap up this, this kind of segment to sort of provide this context. And what I'll do is I'll now hand it off to Dominique, who will now talk about some of the macro implications of, of all of this. Thank you, Bilal. Um, what I'd like to do is to frame uh, the issues, uh, explain how we've been thinking about them. And I'm going to discuss three things. First, why we think uh, the fiscal policy aspect of the election is the most important. Second, I want to discuss the size of the fiscal packages under different uh, color combination for the White House uh, and the Senate. And third, I'm going to discuss how we uh, arrived uh, at the probability for uh, each uh, color uh, configuration. So first, um, a few words on why fiscal policy is probably the most important macroeconomic consequence of this election. Uh, Bilal, if you can show table four, please. So three reasons. First, uh, the uh, recovery is uh, petering out. I mean, it's just losing momentum. Um, I know we've had this absolutely uh, record setting uh, third quarter GDP, um, but it's a backward looking indication. It's a low, uh, it's a low frequency indicator. Uh, if you look at higher frequency data, which uh, I'm showing you here, I'm showing you the Dallas Fed Employment Index, uh, which is a real-time NFP, if you will, uh, which is weekly. I'm showing you credit card spending. I'm also showing you the Dallas Fed Mobility Index for the whole of the US. Um, you can see that we've had a sort of a square root shaped recovery uh, with a very fast uh, recovery up to Q2 and then things started to stagnate, um, which makes sense given that one of the key provisions of the CARES Act was uh, high unemployment benefit payments and those expired at the end of July. Um, so it is clear to me that uh, with some states closing down again uh, as a result of the third uh, wave of cases, we need more stimulus and we need it fast. And the stimulus has to be fiscal because at this stage, uh, monetary policy is not going to do much. Um, household are not borrowing, they are just borrowing to buy houses, but that's not enough uh, to uh, uh, give more momentum to the recovery. Uh, corporates have borrowed huge amounts, but they've used the money uh, either to buy financial assets uh, or to buy real estate, or they've even put the money in, the, in bank accounts. Um, so uh, we do need a sort of a direct uh, transfer of purchasing power that can only come from fiscal policy. The, the other reason why fiscal policy is really what matters is that we can really take uh, Fed support uh, for granted. Um, basically, the Fed has a mandate to stabilize the economy uh, while Congress does not. So no matter what Congress does in terms of fiscal policy, by law, the Fed has to offset uh, to make sure that we get back to uh, full employment. Uh, second, the Fed believes that um, monetary policy is transmitted through financial conditions. So what this means is that whenever you have spare capacity, uh, the Fed cannot afford a tightening of financial conditions. So it means we have a, a Fed put, um, in other words. And of course, the last reason why we can really take the Fed for granted is that uh, they have committed to this inflation overshoot. So that these are the reasons why fiscal policy is probably the most important aspect uh, of the election. Um, with a three to six month horizon. 
Now, the next thing I would like to discuss in terms of framing is the size of the package um, that we are going to get. And it's, the rule is very simple. If the White House and Congress are of the same colors, so um, blue being a Democrat and red Republican, we get a bigger package. We get the biggest package, of course, if uh, both the Senate and the White House are blue, because uh, Democrats uh, tend to be less uh, concerned by uh, deficit and public spending than Republicans. Um, and on the other hand, if the White House and the Senate are a different color, we will get the smallest package uh, if we have a blue White House and a red Senate, um, as was the case in uh, 2010, when a blue uh, White House had to deal with a, a pro-cyclical fiscal policy imposed by a red Senate. So I think we would very much get a repeat of that scenario. Can we move to uh, table two, please? Okay, so in that table, uh, I show the different uh, scenario uh, and, uh, and probability. Um, so how did we arrive at the probabilities? So the key assumption is that in order to get um, an agreement, so to get the Democrat and Republicans talking to each other again, we need first to have an agreement on the outcome of the elections. And the agreement on the outcome of the elections is of course more likely uh, to come early if the winning side wins by a big uh, margin. Based on the current uh, polls, um, uh, and as Bilal you know, explained, uh, whether it's uh, based on polls or uh, on prediction markets, uh, the most likely scenario uh, is a blue wave. Um, so um, let me walk through, uh, let me walk you through the, uh, a couple of uh, key scenarios. So we've given a 60% probability to um, blue wave early agreement scenario, uh, which we think would translate into a small uh, stimulus, um, a small stimulus uh, in the uh, fourth quarter. Uh, if we have a blue White House and a blue Senate. And the reason is uh, that uh, on the Republican side, the rational thing to do uh, would be to basically uh, agree, recognize that they have lost, uh, their strategy didn't work. Uh, so rather than practice a scorched earth policy, uh, just sign off on the 500 billion they had offered in September. Uh, and on the Democrat side, they would sign off as well uh, with the idea of doing a much uh, bigger stimulus uh, in, uh, in Q1. And in Q1, that means uh, basically after the inauguration, uh, which is at the end of January. So, so for all practical purposes, it would be uh, in uh, February. So this is the most uh, likely uh, scenario um, under the, you know, the high margin of victory. The second most likely is that where we have a blue White House and a red Senate. And there we would have again the 500 billion uh, and uh, uh, this time around, so, so we would have the 500 billion uh, before the end of the year, this time around, uh, it would be the Democrats who would have to, you know, swallow uh, the defeat of their strategy and behave in a rational manner uh, and sign off on the 500 billion that the Republicans are offering. There would be more uh, the, um, in February, the blue White House would push for more, 
but uh, the Senate would not agree to anything more than another 500 billion. So now let me talk about what happens if the polls are wrong uh, and the uh, prediction markets uh, are right, and it's a it's a tight uh, it's a tight result. In that case, we are likely, as you know, as Bilal was explaining, to have a very contentious uh, post-election uh, period where we will have state by state disputes over the election results. And in that context, I really don't think uh, we are likely to get anywhere close to a discussion on a, on a new package. I would also say that uh, with a small margin, um, it seems to me um, that the most likely outcome is actually uh, the, the status quo, that President, uh, President Trump uh, keeps the White House uh, and keeps uh, the Senate. Uh, and in that case, we would only get a stimulus um, next year. But President Trump, who likes to spend, likes deficit, probably would be able to get the Senate Republican to raise their offer. So we could get a trillion uh, next year. Um, the, uh, the other possibility is to have a, what we call a, a gridlock, where basically uh, uh, Biden wins the White House, but fails to uh, win a majority uh, in the Senate. And there again, we only get a stimulus uh, next year. Uh, and we only get 500 billion because we are in the scenario where that is basically a repeat of 2010. Uh, so this is just uh, to give you a sort of a flavor of uh, what the timing and the size of fiscal policy uh, could be. In terms of monetary policy, uh, as I explained earlier, the Fed has no choice because of the mandate asymmetry they just have to uh, compensate for what Congress is doing. So for instance, if we have, uh, if we don't have an agreement, if we have a low margin uh, result, no agreement on a stimulus in uh, Q4, they will think they are very likely to ease at the December meeting. With that, I will hand over to George. Thanks, Dominique, <clears throat> and thanks for putting into context this, the scenarios uh, and, and really you know, a difficult time to predict anything in the world that we live in. Uh, and I think that's an important point to, to emphasize. Um, you know, the way that you know, we look at the world and, 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 and in general, strategists have this uh, way of, of thinking, it's really in a probability weighted and trying to figure out what's priced in versus you know, what could be the potential outcome. And so although you know, Dominique gave us you know, a, a series of actual potential uh, scenarios, you know, those necessarily do not align perfectly with how the market's actually set up as we head into this you know, critical event tomorrow and, and key for, for the US. So I, I'd like to kind of start and maybe go up to, to chart one. and discuss, you know, what probably matters, well, we're obviously focused on the election, but, you know, really it looks like the bond market is focused on the overall potential of a, a, a sweep by, by the Democrats. And what I'm showing you here on, on, on chart one is uh, the blue sweep probabilities uh, from, from Bloomberg um, and the 10 year rate and highlighting a couple of key events that have, have transpired since the beginning of really the, the, the heart of the election season starting in, in late September and seeing the kind of the ebbs and flows of how the markets evolved with uh, the blue sweep probabilities. You know, as, as you heard from Bilal at the beginning of, of this uh, webinar, traditionally, and this actually goes against you know, kind of standard uh, convention or, or what markets and, and many practitioners think that you know, Democrats are more fiscally uh, prone to spend money versus the, the, the Republicans, as we've now learned in the last four years, that's not true. Uh, but you know, uh, historically speaking, you know, that, that's usually been the case. But ironically enough, as Bilal mentioned, and it's very true, that you know, rates after a Republican win typically go higher, and, and after a Democratic win, 
they usually go lower. And, and, and the reasons for that, as you know, as we kind of went through, is concerns around deflationary uh, tendencies around potentially more regulation, more taxes that may come from a democratic uh, regime versus a Republican, more laissez-faire, if that's still true in, in, the, in the case. But that's what the market's perceptions are. And also, in general, I mean, US rates will then start to price in higher real growth and higher real rates, which is going to be a really important uh, point and really will key, uh, be something that the Fed will key off of. Real rates is really what drives everything, uh, both from precious metals to what's going on with liquidity, as well as what's happening in, in, um, in risk markets, you know, really through the, the prism of inflation expectations. So looking at tips and how they react is really going to be critical here. But you know, typically, a Republican win does see higher rates on average. We saw that in 2016, the surprise win of President Trump did see you know, rates really break out of a range and, and really stayed above that once he became president for the most part. So um, that's you know, obviously historically speaking, but we're in a very you know, unprecedented times given it's 2020 and what we just went through uh, with, with COVID and, and, and et cetera. You know, the markets want to kind of embrace a narrative. And so given that you know, the narrative now is that a blue sweep would mean equal higher rates, you know, that's kind of what's been driving the, the overall higher rate environment. But I do have some concerns around this, primarily around what happens with real rates versus inflation. So that's something to watch in the next you know, 24 hours to see how tips really react. That's gonna be giving us more information as well as the curve. We've seen um, a steady rise in rates from you know, breaking out of a range that's been in the summer, anywhere between you know, the, you know, the low 60s to the high 70s. We now are in the low 80s on the 10 year treasury yield and started to really you know, get to key levels where um, I, I hate to use these sort of kind of win-win scenarios. I'm very skeptical about you know, both, both outcomes will produce the same sort of um, results in the markets, but this one might actually work out that way because the Fed is on hold. And so if there's any sort of movements in, in the bond market, it's gonna be primarily long-term rates and not short-term rates. And on, on top of that, as you know, we've kind of seen both parties are willing to spend, especially you know, in the midst of the pandemic. So we're still going to get more fiscal spending. And how much is, of that will it you know, take? You know, and how much is already priced in for the bond market is really what we're trying to uh, assess here. Meanwhile, we're at these kind of a confluence of some very key technical levels on the 10-year, the 30-year already broke through the 200-day moving average. The 10-year is, is, is kind of flirting with it. And you know, uh, you know, uh, the best outcomes for markets obviously would be a clear victor that we will know either on the night of or you know, shortly thereafter. But even so, I, I really don't expect a massive pullback in rates, uh, and I still think rates should continue to head higher, um, either with a Republican win or a Democratic win, largely because both of them are going to be spending uh, to, to help get us through this pandemic. And I do think that the, the historical nature of a, re of a Republican win especially if it's a status quo and the Republicans hold the Senate and, and Trump um, maintains, uh, maintains power, that should still result in higher rates, not to the same level that we saw in 2016, but I do think we're going to have a higher rate environment there. And then conversely, the blue wave is probably what's a lot largely priced in. You might not get as big of a sell-off because of this concern around what it might do for other asset classes. But nonetheless, I do think that an overall right, higher rate environment still hangs in here. And then the question then becomes, how high can we really go? What's the, Fed, what's the Fed's reaction function to this? And as Dominique mentioned, you know, can they really, you know, uh, are, are they you know, at, at a stage uh, to actually you know, change policy? Will it be meaningful? How can they actually control rates from heading even higher? Will be the next you know, topic that we'll move to once we get clarity on the election. But nonetheless, you know, we've been in this kind of upward swing as chart one shows, like linked to blue wave, but it could very well be that markets realizing that in either scenario, long-term rates really have no reason to head much lower unless we're heading into a really protracted slowdown where we get no fiscal support and the Fed just kind of sits on its hands, which I don't expect. So let's kind of maybe um, scroll down to the, the other scenarios that we had during 2000, 2010, 2016, and maybe work our way backwards, given that I mentioned a few of these points already, uh, looking at chart seven, uh, just so that you know, we can get a sense of uh, the, the levels that took place there. And, and really an environment where you know, a Republican win, which was a sweep back then as well, 
uh, resulted in a stronger dollar and higher rates when the 10 year uh, you know, broke above 2% and kind of made its way towards two and a half by the end of the year. I'm not expecting a 50 basis point type sell off or more than that if Trump were to win. But you know, we could easily broach 1%. And then that's going to become interesting to see how does the Fed react. We have a Fed meeting uh, later on this week. I doubt they're going to introduce any new policy. But we'll probably start to hear them humming and hawing into December's meeting if we start to see 1%, 1, you know, 115, 125, probably gets to a level where they're not comfortable, especially given where the economy is. So those are the kind of at least the upper bounds we could think about. And then if we kind of um, scroll up and go to the 2010 experience, chart six, which you know, Dominique also mentioned, which is kind of an environment of gridlock, where uh, back then we saw um, the President Obama ex extend the Bush tax cuts. Uh, and, and we were also at a point where the Fed had just, you know, this is, you know, feels like ancient history, where the Fed had launched QE2. And back then people were viewing QE as much more of an inflationary policy versus what, what we now know is more of just a liquidity injection. And, you know, we saw rates also similar pattern like we saw in 2016 overall rates headed higher into the end of the year. Uh, you know, the, que the question here with a gridlock scenario, as, you know, as Dominique you know, nicely put it, as long as you know, the Republicans do not take a scorched earth policy, we should still get some fiscal stimulus, at least a minimum of 500 billion. And then we'll see how the economy is doing in early uh, 2021. And if there's, you know, if there's some sort of recovery on track, maybe they won't give us any further stimulus, but you know, chances are they probably would fold again and give us more. In this kind of a gridlock scenario, this is probably the only scenario where you might get the opposite of what we saw in 2010 and actually see rates head a little bit lower. But I don't, I don't expect us to get back down to like the 50 basis point range, which was my old target in the summer for those that remember. You know, that, that level should still kind of be a hard level to break unless we see stock market really come into trouble here. So I, overall, you know, this would be an environment where we, we trade at a higher range until we get into the other side and see how the economy is doing. And then the last point, which this is the one where rates could really rally, and, and this is uh, the chart five, is if we get a repeat, which would be even probably more, more contentious than what we saw in 2000 between the, uh, the uh, waiting on the decision between who won Bush versus Gore, which was only really decided towards the, the, you know, the December 12th or 13th back then, if we have to wait till that December period to find out, you know, that high levels of uncertainty uh, and the acrimony that may, that may come with it would really be bond, bond bullish and a curve steepener would really work the best in that environment as volatility overall would rise. So these are kind of like just some historical context. Again, you know, history is not any indicator of future performance as we all know, but it's good to kind of get a good you know, glimpse at what we saw in prior elections and to kind of get a sense of the scope and magnitude they may you know, come all through the lens of that we know that the Fed is watching this very closely and they don't want rates to gap higher either. So it's a little bit different. You know, 2016, the Fed was, in a, was starting a hiking cycle. It's now in a uh, lower for longer, you know, very much accommodative mode, focused on market functioning more so than out, outright new easing. But if they had to, they would. Um, and you know, we'll, we'll, we'll see. So, we have some scope. It might be capped to the upside of how high rates can go, and you know, and depends on the in the environment of how rates are heading higher. What that might do for other risk assets, and um, you know, I think you know those are you know primarily most of the things that um, I want to cover, Bilal. Before you know, passing it back to you to take any kind of questions. Great. Uh, thank you very much, George, for for that. Um, and uh, you know, I, I just urge everybody to send in your your questions and answer your questions to uh, so that we can answer it. And before to give you time to do that, I just wanted to uh, just mention one or two uh, one or two things. You know, one was um, this uh, article that George was showing. It's available to members, um, or at least versions of that report is available to members. And uh, let me just show you. Uh, how to access some of this stuff. So um, for people uh, who are, if you just go to macrohive.com, uh, you can uh, just subscribe to 
become a free member. So you just you start a free trial uh, for the first month. It's free. And then you pay uh, £39 or $39 per month thereafter. Then you can access some of that content. Um, so it's easy to get to that site. Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention is that we have a competition running at the moment as well, where we have a higher end research product, which has a lot more trade ideas, models, and so on, you know, which costs a lot more than this website. Um, but we're offering a subscription to that higher end product, which is worth say $5,000 to this competition um, where you have to say who will win in six key battleground states. So Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, and so on. And if you get all the answers correct, then we'll give you a subscription to our higher end uh, product. It's quite a fun thing to do. And this, uh, this closes tomorrow um, uh, afternoon UK time uh, before any of the election results get announced. So we've had a ton of people who've already uh, you know, given their predictions. Uh, so people who haven't, this is your chance to uh, make your, your predictions um, and uh, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll have it on record then whether you're right or not. There's many people who claim to have predicted 2016 without any uh, uh, track with any, uh, anything written down. This will be a way to prove that you were right in this election. Um, so if we just go back to the Q and A, um, okay, there's a bunch, a ton of questions. Uh, the first one um, is around uh, just clarification. Uh, this, I guess, more for George. So if we were to have a clean sweep, so if we had uh, a Democrat clean sweep, what would your sort of targets be for the U.S. ten-year yield um, by the end of this year, or in So, I mean, look, end of this year is going to feel like eternity. Um, let's take it a couple of weeks at a time. Yeah. You know, if we were to see a clean sweep, and it's and it's and it's obvious that we know that by the end of the end of this week, early part of next week, and we'll see how everything gets counted. But if, if the margins are there, and and we actually see, you know, that conclusion, the market's not going to wait. I think it's going to get a good sense, and it's going to start to continue to build upon this discounting. That we've had seen already, as I mentioned in chart one, which showed a bond market getting concerned about the fiscal load that's about to hit us. Because of, uh, you know, I know $3 trillion is another large number that we've heard earlier this year around the CARES Act, but it's going to be compounding on top of a very large uh, you know, debt outstanding that's already out there. And, and the market would also realize that if that 2.5 plus 500 billion is, is, is not enough, the Democrats will probably continue to do more. and and there's you know, concerns around what might happen on the more fringe side of the Democratic Party. Do they get you know, control and start to you know, insist on you know, bigger deals like the Green Deal, a Green New Deal? So I think the bond market will start to price that in, and we can will very well go towards one percent. Um, and then the question then becomes, uh, you know, like, as I mentioned in my, in my prepared remarks, if we get towards one one and a quarter, how does the Fed react? That that's when the Fed comes into play. So. I think that they, they do have uh, in mind some version of how they're going to execute yield curve control. It doesn't necessarily have to be through the nominal rate side, although nominals will be the biggest piece of it. As we've seen um, since the, the beginning of this uh, pandemic and the Fed's reaction to it, a, a large slug of it has come through the purchase of, of tips and they've become a really dominant player in that market. I think that you know they're really going to be focused on the real rate rise relative to the nominal rise. If if rates are rising and inflation expectations are collapsing, then we're going to see more of like a, a, a twisting of the tips curve more so than anything that we've seen before. So that would be, I think. Yeah. Uh, and then, then uh, there was a follow-up question from somebody else around uh, if we get the non-consensus outcome. So if we get either a Trump win or we get um, Biden winning, but not the Senate. So the Republicans retain the Senate. In those two scenarios, what do you think? So in those two scenarios, I mean, considering that most of the heavy lifting of, of the deficit would, and, and any sort of fiscal package, would primarily still be the belly of the curve, uh, you, you would probably see the, the belly of the curve not sell off as much. So, the, so then the tenure would not go up to one and a quarter, but could still go a little bit higher. But what will end up happening is you get more of a kind of a flirt, flirting around bull, bull steepening type moves where the five year through the 10 year part of the curve would outperform the rest of the treasury curve because you know, the view would be that you know, we're not gonna get 
all of his stimulus and it won't leave the, a heavy footprint on the bond market. Yeah. Okay, we have a, a, another question this time, more of a longer run question. So I guess let's kind of define long run. I'll define it as say two or three years. Um, what would be the longer term uh, consequence of um, a Democrat clean sweep? So maybe I'll go to Dominique first on that. Let's go kind of for the macro side and then we can talk a bit about markets. So um, in my view, the biggest consequence is inflation. Uh, for structural reasons, we are in a low inflation environment. And the structural reasons have very much to do with the lack of bargaining power of workers and also with the monopoly power of employers, monopoly on the labor market, but also very importantly on the goods market. This is disinflationary because it means that with this market power, uh, employers can keep the share of workers in national income very low. It also means that when workers have no uh, bargaining power, we have a very flat Phillips curve. So we can't get the wage inflation spiral that we need for an acceleration of inf inflation. So if we get a clean uh, blue sweep, for instance, um, and President Biden starts implementing his plan for the labor market, uh, also we're starting to see more of a bipartisan consensus on the need to uh, reduce monopolist uh, power, I think we could have a very deep uh, transformation of the economy and we could move away from the low inflation regime we are in, which means that things we are now taking for granted, like you know the Fed puts, uh, all of these things would go and it would not be a pleasant process for market participants. Okay, yeah. I mean, from my side, you know, I think one of the consequences, I actually think it will be quite positive for risky markets in the long run, because I think that the, the key policy variable that will drive the economy now is more fiscal than monetary, as everybody's been saying. And I think the Democrats will be much uh, more willing to, you know, employ larger fiscal stimulus, which I think will be the big swing variable between different countries now. So I think it'll be quite positive for US risky, risky markets like equities. And according to the historical patterns, Democrat uh, equity gains tend to kick in a bit further down the line rather than early on. Um, but I think given that today monetary policy can't do as much of the, the lifting, um, I then, uh, I therefore uh, think that um, it will be quite positive for risky markets uh, overall. Uh, George, I'm not sure if you have anything to, to add on, on that note. Um, there's another question. This is um, uh, a question more about election mechanics. What sort of majority would be needed for either side to not contest um, especially Trump, and if it is contested, how much does it swing the outcome into Trump's favor, given that the, the conservatives control the Supreme Court now? Um, Dominique, maybe you can do you want to take this first? Sure. Um, so I wouldn't uh, establish a one and one, one to one mapping of the Supreme Court uh, number of conservative uh, justices. Uh, to uh, positive uh, bias in uh, favor of President Trump. I mean, we've seen in uh, pre-election Supreme Court uh, decisions they've taken one in favor of the Republicans. Uh, I believe this was in Texas and two uh, against the Republicans, I believe in Pennsylvania and Wisconsin. So I wouldn't, uh, you know, I think the, the court Obviously, the justices have their views on the law, but it's an institution that is probably looking beyond the next administration. And I don't think they would want uh, to take decisions that could, um, you know, uh, show them as uh, overly politicized in the eyes of the public and in the long run. Uh, reduce their influence uh, on, uh, on, on American politics, which is not just about rulings, but about the moral authorities that they have. So I wouldn't necessarily assume that a six to three 
conservative majority automatically means biased decisions in favor of President Trump. Yeah, that's a good point, Dominique. I, I think you, you're right. You point out some of the recent decisions in uh, Pennsylvania and so on. It seems like the federal court or the Supreme Court's really reluctant to usurp the power of the state in terms of how they run the election. So it probably will vary state to state. I mean, that seems to be the general message, like not to interfere with the state constitution and the state legislature. Um, there is a question um, on positioning. Maybe, George, you can take this. How do you think the market's positioned into the election? Yeah, so <clears throat> I think pretty pretty defensive. I mean, as we mentioned at the start, um, we're not going into this blindly. We, we obviously have been preparing for this all year long, especially the last couple of weeks. So I do think that overall positioning, uh, depending on, you know, like if we start with the rates market, if there has been a kind of slight de-risking, uh, although there is a structural type short that's out there, uh, a lot of it could just be more for kind of hedging as well as um, looking at kind of some spread type trades. So I'm not sure it's really indicative of a uh, fuel for the fire that's gonna snap the market one way or the other. I think people have taken down a lot of positions and that's kind of allowed um, for rates to kind of grind higher. There was this constant bid on, on fixed income all throughout the year with the Fed on hold and with, you know, just kind of some of the buying appetite slowing down with the uncertainty of, of the election as well as fiscal policy. I think that's, you know, in, you know, already kind of reflected both, you know, slightly priced in, let's call it 60 to 70% priced in and positioning pr probably a little bit on the short side, but not by much. Um, and so there's still scope for a higher rate environment from here if we were to get the outcomes I described earlier. And then we look at other markets and then I'm sure, well, you can mention it too on, on FX and equities. Um, I think, you know, it depends on, you know, we've had a, a big bull run. Um, I think people are also you know, taking some chips off the table given the price action that we've seen in risk assets. So I think by and large, I think it, it's, it, it, you probably see a bigger reaction uh, and that makes sense, uh, knee-jerk reaction in the, the subsectors of each uh, asset class. I think that's gonna be what we have to really look at, you know, what happens between value, between growth, what happens between you know, the healthcare versus technology, there's going to be like uh, subsectors that we have to really focus on to get you know a, a sense of. And you know, once we have a clear victor, obviously, uh, and then I think on the dollar, I mean, uh, look, it's not like as Ball mentioned, we're now at the stage where uh, fiscal policy globally will set the stage for the direction of each country more so than monetary policy, and whoever has the bigger bigger fiscal guns are going to win, in, in so to speak. Is that necessarily super negative for the dollar? I mean, the dollar probably still has um, some scope for a further run, in my humble opinion. Uh, it really just could, depends on how big of a fiscal package we get from the Democrats. Right. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, we have a question on thoughts on emerging markets after the election. Um, it says many people expect Biden to be good for EM. Uh, is, that, uh, is that something we agree with or not? Um, Dominique, do you want to say something? And I'll, I'll say something as well on that. Uh, Dominique, you're... So in my view, it's not so much about Biden. Uh, it's much more about the Fed. If the Fed maintains uh, loose uh, dollar funding conditions, uh, I think we're very likely to see, in fact, a global credit boom. I mean, given the expansion of the balance sheet, once we get over the fright of the pandemic, which will eventually happen, uh, this should be very uh, positive for emerging market, irrespective uh, of whether it's uh, Biden or Trump, because I don't think it makes that much of a difference for the Fed. Yeah, I'd, I'd sort of generally be sympathetic as well. I mean, I think perhaps the biggest difference, I suppose, would be US-European relations might be a bit better because that's been something that probably the two parties don't agree on. Um, I think both parties have a consensus on, you know, somehow uh, containing China, but I think there's a difference in terms of how they view Europe. And I think there may be less of an adversarial approach to Europe so that those relations may improve, which in turn then could be put more positive for some of the EM uh, European markets, perhaps at the margin. Um, I mean, the other wild card I would say is there's a question of you know, obviously Trump did have a lot of rhetoric and which introduces noise into the market around China, but there's a question of effectiveness. And if Biden does take a multilateral approach to try to contain China, that may be more effective in breaking the link between China and the US. So 
that's probably a bit of a wild card to, to see how that unfolds. Um, but broadly speaking, you know, I think in the end, what will be more important is how much of a growth engine is the US. If it's a strong growth engine on the credit side, fiscal side, then that will, you know, drag everybody higher globally. Um, you know, I, I see we're kind of running close to the end of our thing. There's actually a, a, an interesting question, um, which is um, everyone usually criticizes the current dispensation, um, the current administration, and it's fashionable to do that, to criticize Trump. Um, what would the panelists say are some of the positive achievements of Trump during his tenure? So, okay, so I'll take this one. Okay, uh, go for it. <laughs> so first of all, uh, I think it's a very legitimate question. And I would say that uh, my uh, philosophy is not to look at market or politics in normative, judgmental way, but just try to look at it from the perspective of the policymakers, because I will be better able to predict how they will react to surprises than if I bring in my own values. And in terms, so I'm going to answer in a personal uh, manner, uh, not as, a, as an analyst. To me, the biggest contribution that uh, Trump has done, uh, and maybe my panelists will disagree with me, um, is to bring to the awareness of mainstream parties that globalization has not worked for many people, that many people are left behind, and that they need to be a greater focus uh, of both parties. Okay, yep, yeah. no, no, that's a fair point. I should also add, despite uh, Dominique's accent there, uh, Dominique uh, lives in the US and has had lived in the US for, how many, how many years have you been in the US now? Uh, on and off, I'm not sure, maybe uh, 15, uh, but I'm a US citizen. So I was born in France, but uh, my family is American and I'm a US passport holder. Okay. Is it because there's a Trump administration? That's why you're saying very quickly, I'm a US citizen and I have a passport. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not too far from the Mexican border, so I have to be careful what I say. <laughs> George, is there, what would you say is uh, something positive the administration's done over the last four years? Look, I mean, obviously, um, focusing on, on regulation and opening up um, you know, the markets, you know, the, you know, the tax reform and things like that you know, did have a, a huge boost. And, the question, you know, really is, you know, can we make the bond market great again? And and we'll we'll see because for a time we did see, you know, the rates, you know, actually um, you know, move more towards fundamental uh, factors versus just all of us trying to handicap what the Fed's going to do and what fiscal policy is going to do. And, and I think, uh, you know, having seen like overall growth uh, during the early phases of his administration, I think that was probably the more the more um, interesting thing from the market's point of view. Yeah, thanks for that. I mean, from my side, I mean, just to kind of round this off, um, I, I actually think President Trump, the administration hasn't, has actually done some good things on the foreign policy side insofar as the US, as far as I can tell, hasn't overtly started any wars in any uh, foreign countries. And most administrations have tended to start wars uh, internationally. So that, that's, you know, been, uh, you know, and there's been, um, you know, some some movements in the Middle East, which should be more towards, you know, uh, you know, peace agreements. So I think that's been quite positive. I think the other thing on the foreign policy side has been that the US has essentially said that we don't want to be the sole global superpower, you know, we want to share the burden globally. And it's basically telling each region to basically step up, um, especially the Europeans, which I think probably does make some sense, you know, the Europeans need to step up a bit, uh, the Japanese even and so on. So that's been you know, uh, one of the positives, I think, as well. Um, I mean, the, the other kind of more more kind of basic point I would make about the Trump administration is that despite, you know, what he says on Twitter and his manner, if you look at the actual policies President Trump has implemented domestically, they're very conventional Republican policies, you know, cut regulation, cut taxes. I mean, these are like standard Republican policies. So one kind of needs to separate the the mode of uh, behavior versus the things that have actually been implemented as well. Um, okay, I think that we can wrap it up there. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm not based uh, in, in the US. So um, I just wanted to ask you guys, have you guys voted? Are you going to vote in person or not? George and Dominique? You can do it I, in person. I have voted already. Yeah, it's sort of yeah. a mail -in, uh, mail in vote or no, no, no. I went to in my person. Local, local high school. Yeah, very similar. Okay, great. 
Okay, good, good. And George? I'll, I'll do it through dropping it off at my county clerk. Okay. And then what's your rituals for election day itself? Which channels do you prefer to watch to watch the, uh, the coverage? Oh, geez. Uh, have more than one screen. Uh, I'll have Bloomberg on, obviously, and then CNN. Yeah. I mean, what else? Yeah. Yeah. And George, probably uh, similar, I guess. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And, and you have to put Fox too. You have to have all three. Too. Yeah. Okay, cool. Good, good. Okay, great. Okay, I think we can wrap up the uh, the uh, the webinar now. I mean, just uh, just remind everyone, just everyone go to macrohive.com, you know, sign up to become a member. We'll be putting some notes out uh, tomorrow during the election night, stuff on Twitter as well with our views and things like that. And uh, yeah, hopefully the whole process is smooth and we don't have too many controversies and then we can just see uh, who ends up uh, winning. So thanks for everybody. Thank you. Thank you.